Good afternoon. Glad everybody could come out and join us today. Uh, please uh, find your book at the end of the pew and sign in, please. That allows us to keep a record of who is here and who isn't. Um, so please, if you don't mind, sign in. Um, and also on the back, next Saturday, for all you ladies, there's a tea party from two to four. Well, you know, get ready, grab your hat and grab your gloves and come on down and spread some love because we're gonna have a good time that day. Um, so just come and join us. Guarantee you, you'll like it. Um, it's supposed to end before, but don't count on it. <laughs> we seem to get busy and chatting and before you know it, the time is gone. We don't know where it's at. But you'll enjoy the time with it. You've been here in God's house anyway. Um, I hope somebody somewhere got to use what uh, we heard last week and what we learned. I hope in your roundabout going out through the week that you were able to help someone in need. Um, and just remember, trust is a hard thing for us to do and it's also hard for someone to accept. Um, and I understand that and so but I think if we look at it just a little bit different because if we believe in God we got to trust so just when you're out and don't be so shy um, give that nice smile and if you have the opportunity talk with them if not, take time to just ask God to give them a blessing. That will work. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And um, I know that everybody probably has a concern. If you don't have a concern, I hope you have joys. Just lift them up to me. Thank you for the joys and your concern. Just lift them up. And leave them to him. Don't take them back like I do. Because it takes too long to get that concern satisfied. Because he wants us to trust him. So when you have something that you need to go to him in prayer, go trusting him that he is going to make it right. And he will in his time, not our time. When it's right for him and it's the right time for us to receive it, we will. So let's just keep trust in mind. Heavenly Fathers, we come for you today to uh, hear your word and to sing your praises, Lord. We just hope that um, whatever we can do today for you, that we do. And Lord, as we go through or this coming week that we do learn to trust, trust someone, not only you, but to trust someone. We ask that you bless each and every one that's here, and we ask that you get us back to our destination safely, and we ask that you bless the pastor as he does our sermon, it's a great sermon, Lord. Um, and just be with our musicians as they sing your praises. And at times, um, we help them sing them. But let's all leave here today with love in our hearts and kindness for one another. We ask it all in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so this was going to be Ma Ma Donna Risa. I guess it's Ma Ro Donna Risa this time, or what is it? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, Ma Ro. Uh, Ro Ma Ro 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 Donna Risa. All right. His name isn't Ro. No, we're glad his name isn't Mo, or else it would be Mo 
we're not a research, so we don't want to be in the moral We know where we're at. All right, so remember, just say the song, please. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. We are at uh, Don Risa's this morning. We are Matt Maher on mandolin, Teresa Penrose on bass, I'm Donna Russ on guitar, and Rob Edelson on banjo today. And uh, we're going to play some songs for you, some bluegrass songs for you. Like what we usually do, we're going to start off with an instrumental or a fiddle tuner, as they're called. And uh, since it's so beautiful and it really finally is spring, and all, you get to see all the green popping, all of God's creations, all the flowers and everything, we're going to start out with what we call Blackberry Blossom, in honor of uh, everything coming up on that. Fasten your seatbelts, this is kind of a quick one. Thank you. 
sure. And, uh, this is another one you probably noticed by uh, one of the more famous songwriters, Hank Williams. Hank Williams Sr., of course. Uh, this is the one we substituted for the other one in song. Uh, this is one of Rob's favorites, so we're going to do this one right now. It's uh, Go ahead, you tell it. <laughs> so, I saw the light, which you probably heard again. Feel free to sing along with us.
we always love playing with you guys. It's great to come down here and do that. And uh, I'm looking forward to the, the next sermon that's going on here now. And uh, we'll see you again next month, the, the third Friday. Hey, what was I doing? Come on out. That's fine, dude. There we go. Let's get all our stuff. Anyway, thanks a lot. And, uh, we Thank you. But you know, when you're in church, every day is a beautiful day. It never rains, it never storms, it's just always sunshine in the church. Glad to have you with us today. Well, my sermon title of the day was The Risk of Preaching, and scriptures Luke 4, 20, 23, and 28, and 32. So let's hear what the Lord has to say in the scriptures this morning. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physicians, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do it here in your hometown, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. And verses 28 to 32 says, All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off a cliff. That doesn't sound very interesting, does it? But he walked right through the crowd and went his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath, he talked to people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Well, bless this reading of the Lord's word. You probably didn't know, did you, that there's a risk in preaching? Well, there's a big risk for me, I think, in the pastor's preaching or any, anybody. Not talking about somebody throwing a tomato up here. They don't like what I say or what I'm doing. But there is a risk. And it's an implied risk, I guess you could say. For example, when I decided to go to seminary, I started thinking about all the things I should be thinking about, what's it going to be like, you know, what we're going to study, how I do when I get out of seminary, all those things. But one thing stuck in my mind, because as a pastor who stands up here and looks out there and hears that I preach to you, or any pastor doing that, what I say and do from this pulpit may be the difference between a person accepting Christ or rejecting it. Because a lot of people come to church wanting to hear what the pastor's about to say. In other words, they haven't studied. They don't want to spend time in reading the scriptures. They think, well, that's his job. He should be doing that. I'll just listen to what he says. What he says may go. But if the pastor is not teaching the word of God properly, it may have an effect on that person. And as a result of that, that person could stop coming to church or it may even cause him to lose his salvation. Hopefully that will not be the case. But there is a big risk, I think, for pastors because all these days I hope to be in heaven like everybody else. No, I don't hope. I know I'm going to be there. Change the word trap. But being there, I'm going to have to stand in front of God someday. And he might say, well, what have you done for me lately? 
Pastor, who all did you say? Who did you bring to my kingdom? And I'm going to be able to answer that. So that's what I'm saying, that there's a risk to the pastor and preacher. He's really genuinely interested in his people and the congregation and those he talks to. He has to think about those things. So that's what I meant by that in general. Now, most of my congregation here in the early service knows I'm a big football fan, especially the Tennessee Volunteers. That's where I'm from, Tennessee, and Donna's from Florida, so she's for the Gators, and we have big conflicts once a year. But on the ground, we got another conflict. I, Tennessee plays of Missouri, and I think this past year, they got beat from Missouri. And I didn't like that at all, but you can't do much about it. But the idea is, in those games, there's a referee. And that referee pretty much controls what happens in that football game. So many times this past year, for some reason, so many games came down to the last, I mean, four, five, six seconds. And they had to make a decision a lot of times. So did the guy make a first down? Did he not make a first down? Did he pick up a kill goal? Did he not get it right between those posts? It can be very iffy on these type of things. So that, but that referee has total authority on what happens. God has got total authority in our lives as to what's happened. So we have to be aware of that in any way. Heard uh, some referees talking one day, and the person says, you're talking about field goals, or did it make it, or did it not make it, or did you make a first down or not a first down? The first guy says, I call him as a sin. In other words, he's a referee. Uh, I mean, he may not have seen it like everybody did. He may not have seen it like I did, but don't make any difference. He's a referee. He calls the play. The second one says, I call them as they are. Third guy got up and said, until I call them, they ain't nothing. And that's true. I've seen games delayed five, 10, 15 minutes just for them making a decision on that particular play. They have complete authority, and that's what makes the difference. But you may recall in the scripture where men in the synagogue were waiting with expectation for Jesus to deliver a message because he would go into the synagogue and he would teach. And he was undoubtedly a powerful teacher. Now, a lot of people wonder, well, what kind of voice did, did Jesus have? Did he have a big voice, deep voice? They ought to do it. You know, he got to talk to all these people out there, right? So what kind of voice did he have? Remember the feeding of the 5,000? There was actually about 10 or 15,000 people there. But they, Jesus didn't have microphones like this. He didn't have boom boxes. He didn't have all the things we've got today as pastors to reach out to the congregation. But I sort of think that God opened the ears of all those people on that hillside. And Jesus probably in those folk know a lot of what I'm speaking right now, yet they all heard. And that's a miracle within itself, is it not? I don't think, including Billy Graham, I don't think he could be out on the hillside with 10 to 15,000 people and speaking in his normal voice, and everybody would hear. So it becomes very important this man, Jesus, my goodness, the word is getting around. Good preacher talks well, tells us things we didn't even know. But they were waiting to see what kind of reaction the people would get from his sermon. And when we see the, con the consequences of Jesus' preaching, he preached with authority. Now remember, he didn't have the luxury of going to a seminary or anything like that. He didn't go to grade school, I don't think. But he had the authority, he had the knowledge. Everything that it needed to talk about the Word of God and have people understand what he was talking about. Well, this is something that's very important. He grabbed their full attention. They listened. They were sitting in awe. What knowledge this man got? Where did he come from? Who is he? But all the eyes saw him and the ears would hear him. And he was speaking about what it took for God's salvation in their individual lives. And they started thinking about this. Some guys said, well, isn't that the kid that used to run around his father's workshop as he was building furniture and doors and all those type of things? Is that who that is? Isn't that Joseph's son, they would say? Well, we saw this kid growing up. Well, he would say, well, kid, was out playing stickball with his little buddies. And now look at him. Where did he get all this knowledge? Where did he go? How did he know all this stuff? Isn't anything special about him? Well, it sure is. They began having difficulty in what Jesus was talking about because he would say things and tell them things that no other man had told him reading the scriptures, examine them, tell them what it's all about. Well, Jesus knew that. And so he said, well, maybe I should take some time. Maybe I should take the bull by the horns and talk about the Messiah. Talk about, he didn't have to talk about miracles, did he? Because when he was talking, he was telling people about it. 
he wanted you to listen to his words and he wanted you to believe his words. Now, when I was growing up, don't see it so much today, people would make a deal of something. Shake your hand, done deal, right? That's what people used to do. Nowadays, people don't trust you for that. You gotta have an attorney to fifty pages and document to say that you bought a car, or whatever it happens to be. The world has changed. It used to be when I was growing up, my mother used to tell me, John, your word is your bond. You stick with that. You tell people well, they know you and what you stand on, they'll automatically know your word is true and write it on a piece of paper with a bunch of attorneys. But that's what Jesus is saying here. He said, My word is enough. When you hear me, you've heard the gut, you've heard the Lord, right? God. So that's enough authority for the people. Well, at first the people sort of believed it, and then the authority of Jesus hung on to it for a while. And then they, he, Jesus would tell them things that maybe they didn't really know or didn't want to know. Now, if you're a pastor in a pulpit, sometimes, and I've heard pastors say this, by the way, which I disagree on. You ask, well, what kind of sermons do you preach? Well, I just preach the kind of sermons my, sermon, my congregation wants to hear. Well, maybe the congregation needs to hear from the Bible, not necessarily what they want to hear. That's one of the things I've always said as a pastor. I'm going to tell the congregation what they need to know, what, not what they want to know. In some cases, you want to do that as well. But it, it takes a little bit of both, doesn't it? So he started out being very popular, and then he started not so popular because they didn't like what he had to say or the way that he said it. It reminded them of God's special people. He would say, you are God's special people. He is with you and he's for you, but he's for all people. He's not just for the Jews, he's for the Gentiles as well. When God preached, he, or Jesus preached, thanks for him, he wanted to know what is he about? Who is he talking to? The people wanted a Messiah king. They wanted somebody who had a lot of authority, a lot of power, like King David was. They wanted him to bring victory to them in wealth and in prosperity. Excuse my voice. I'll tell you what, these allergies going around, they're getting to pick up and get to you. Excuse me. You should never have to do that. Never had an allergy problem until this year. Jesus was also looked at as who he hung around with. He didn't have an army. He didn't have a home. He had no basic wealth. He only had 12 guys running around with him. They believed in him, but they didn't understand him after the time he had explained all these things to him time and time again. But Jesus taught the things that stirred up the people. Because if I preach a sermon sometime and you go away and just happy as can be, but I haven't said anything that stirred your heart, stirred your mind, stirred your soul, made you want to question. And that's good, what I might have to say from the pulpit. And Jesus wanted that kind of relationship. But they said, well, this is just a wandering creature. He comes and he goes. I don't know about that. And look who he hangs around with. Just a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors. All these sinners. They didn't consider himself one of those sinners, did they? But it brings to mind that Jesus came to us in the lowest of things, the lowest of people, the lowest of birth. Born in the manger. I mean, how much lower can you get than that in society, culture back then? Not very low. But Jesus was trying to get them to understand that he didn't have to do all these miracles to get their attention. But his word meant something to him. His word meant something to what he said. So God doesn't need great wealth. He doesn't even need a show. He doesn't need an army to follow him around everywhere. His word was his bond, and they began to learn that. That's what they did. So, depending on what you say, it's very important when you're preaching or talking to somebody, it's what you say, the words you use makes a big difference on what the way people hear, right? You didn't have to do a miracle to an ordinary person. His word was his bond. And as a pastor, we are vehicles of Jesus' fulfillment, his word. I'm no better than anybody else. I've got a different calling than the majority of the people who come to church. But you have a calling as well. It's very good if you can learn what God wants you to do. Then you learn, well, how am I going to do it? What am I going to say? What am I going to do to fulfill God's word? When God brings truth to all these words in your heart, mind, you accept Jesus Christ, he's touched your heart. And God's spirit brings authority to what he says and what he does. He changes people's lives. 
we proclaim the word of God, where does it come from? It comes from scripture, the Bible, what he gave us. We do hymns and liturgy, and a lot of churches don't do liturgy type of things, and what this one does, the church is one that provides liturgy, provides hymns, and the sermon, it all goes together, which, is, which means that I, the pastor, am a tool, I'm a vehicle to proclaim God's word. But that doesn't mean I'm any better than any of you sitting out here or anybody else. It just means I have a different vocation, right? But we feel the spectrum of all emotions. A lot of people think, well, something about a pastor, he don't have to deal with the problems I have to deal with, and this, that, or the other. But that's wrong. We experience emotion, we experience joy, we experience loneliness, we experience happiness, we experience sorrow, we experience defeat at times. But we know God has called us to deliver the message of salvation to the people in general. Uh, God does not call just pastors, by the way, and I'm sure you know this. You too have a calling. And if you discover what your calling is, now, the bluegrass you just listened to a minute ago, there's a calling in that. There, there's the religious songs that they sing that has a message. That's interesting. Most of religious songs have a message embedded in them. And if you just listen to the music, you're listening to a sermon. You're listening to what God put on their heart and mind to write that particular song. If you listen close enough, I'm sure you can always find a message scattered throughout that sermon, throughout the music that they pray here. <laughs> Through your work, the things you say, the things that you do, the way you feel, you bring God's message of salvation to the people you need. Now, at one point in my life, I worked for Mutual Omaha, which is an international company, and my territory was the United States. I might go to work on a Monday morning, thinking I'm going to stay at the office all day, and I'll be catching a plane that afternoon to go to New York or some other state. I never knew week to week where I was going a lot of times. And in that process, I've met a lot of people, a lot, you know, with different religious backgrounds, the different meetings we would have. Sometimes it would get around to discussing religion. That's a topic everybody likes to talk about. And so during those period of times, I was talking to people about their religion, about what they believed, what they didn't believe. So I had a ministry and didn't even realize it at the time that I was doing this, but it all tied in. And maybe God was using me in that particular vehicle to reach people I never could have reached before. And by the way, I feel very strong about this. And God puts each one of us in the position that he wants you and I to be in at any given time. He really directs, sometimes we think we direct our lives, right? Not so, God puts us there, he places us there. You'll meet people, things you say and things you do that you never dreamed of hearing or saying before. It just works out that way. So I just want you to be aware of that, that your life from day to day, you've got a, you, you, I, I call it this, I say you've got a calling card on your chest that calling card is to you to meet people, to talk about Jesus, and all that you do. So many people are afraid to bring up religion and talk about that in their normal work day. There's people out there that need to hear about Jesus Christ, and that's the way that you and I can do it. All of us are pastors, lay people are pastors, but you and I both can use God's word up here. That's a tool, his vehicle, his instruments, his pen, to show them the way of salvation. But I can tell you what I was a pastor or a lay person sitting out there, I would not want to wind up in front of Jesus and have him ask me, what have you done for me lately? Too many people just don't know. The one expecting that question, and they haven't really done it. They call themselves Christians. But your job and my job as a Christian, as a believer, is to get the word out of Jesus Christ. What does it take to come save? Ask them a question, and you never know the response you'll get. I was listening to a pastor on television last week, and he was talking about it, a young man who first got started uh, going to a particular church, and they would teach him how to go and uh, meet people and talk about people on the street. He said he, he got off one day at this particular intersection, and said he saw a lady sitting on a bench by a bus stop. He said, well, First time for everything. So he said, I think I'll see what she has to say. And I'll walk over there to her and I'll just ask her some questions. So he did. He walked over and said, ma'am, that uh, uh, I don't know 
student at this, at this seminary and I would like to ask you some questions. She said, okay. So he started asking her questions. Do you believe in Jesus? She said, oh yes, I do. Do you believe that you're saved? Oh yes, I do. He kept asking these questions. So finally he found out he ran out of questions and she agreed with him. <laughs> They're not the worst. That was, he said, I didn't know what to do next. She actually agreed with me. And what the thing I said. So you don't know what that person, but she is not accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in her life. And he said, would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And she said, yes, I would. He said, I didn't know what to do next. That's quite open to the question. But that's what happens. You never know when you're talking to somebody what it's going to take to get there. We just have to have the courage to do that. Look how much courage Jesus had when the Father sent him to the cross to die on that cross, a terrible hatred, death. People that nearly killed him walking through the streets carrying that cross on his back, right? Until he had some help to help him get up to the, to the top of the, to the mountain there. But we just, sometimes we overthink ourselves, which is a bad thing to do, but that's human nature on our part. So as we think about these things, as you meet people today, when you go through those doors today, you're in the mission field. I had a, a lady one time asking another a, a elder one of my church and says, you know, she was a black lady from Africa. And she said this, she said, uh, the one black woman visiting from Africa said, you might live in a Christian land, but why are your churches only half full? The fastest growing nation for Christianity today is Africa. It's almost like it was 2,000 years ago. The people are hungry for the word of God. Why? Because they had never heard it before. And all of a sudden they were hearing from these pastors and missionaries the word of God. See, we've gotten so used to seeing the church on every corner, you know, that type of thing. They don't have that. They're where the church was 2,000 years ago. And that's the strongest area of believers and Christians today is over in Africa. If you know someone, my friends, that doesn't go to church, doesn't belong to a church, but you know, maybe it's family. Maybe it's a cousin, or a brother, or a sister, or an aunt, or an uncle. And you know they're not saved. I think you will be bearing the responsibility of not talking to the Lord, or talking to them when the Lord asks you, well, what about your cousin Bob? Or what about your sister Sue? You knew they weren't saved because you didn't have the courage to talk to them about salvation and the way they become saved. They're lost. It's going to be on your shoulder. It's going to be on my shoulder. That's what I'm talking about. So, with that in mind, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. How wonderful it is that we worship a God like you. That we know who is God. We know where we should be and what we should do and what we should say. And Lord, I just thank you that I heard the word from someone who made me come, become a Christian follower of Jesus Christ. For these things I ask, in Christ's name, amen. Now, I was told that our, our piano player is not here today, she's home sick, but at this time I'm going to ask uh, Charlie to come put me and help to do the offering this time. And I want to thank you for being here as well. Really do appreciate it. We're all you guys coming up here. You guys can make it.
and a taxi cab driver went to his new house and a preacher was next and said, oh yeah, we've been waiting for you too. He said, we got a little log cabin over here on the edge of heaven, a nice comfortable place, everything you need. And the preacher said, fine, good. He said, but just out of curiosity, he said, what did that New York taxi cab driver do that got that big bull hunt? He said, well, here in heaven, we go on results. And that New York taxi cab driver turned more people on to Jesus than you did. <laughs> Mary, I gotta say that I've never, I've never told the service on a joke, but that one applies. First half everything, right? Okay, just a second now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for these folks who come to share this day with us. Bless them, be with them. We thank you for the offer that they gave to proclaim you as Lord and Savior and to build your kingdom here. We thank I ask in Christ's name. Amen. So with that in mind, you folks are free to get up and go. Hey, thank you for being here. A real pleasure. A real pleasure. Jam session in Fellowship Hall and chicken and dumplings. Lewis, you ought to be my second banana on this stuff.